The concept that humanity is teetering on the edge of a third world war is no longer the domain of the lunatic fringe. Those of you who have been paying attention know that in reality, the war is already underway. In this video, we're going to examine the profiles of the key players and the alliances they formed, expose their motives, and present evidence of crimes that they've already committed. All of our sources will be available in the link below. First, let's outline the basic alliances. Russia, China, and Iran have all explicitly sided with the Syrian government. Russia is providing air support, advanced anti-aircraft missile systems, heavy weapons, and training. Iran, for its part, has troops on the ground. For the time being, China is more preoccupied with the ongoing tensions in the South China Sea, and has not flexed its muscles in Syria as of yet. However, they should always be considered a wildcard variable. The current Iraqi government is also a wildcard. In 2015, they began to indicate where their loyalties lay in several meaningful ways. For example, they told the U.S. government that new ground operations were not welcome, while at the same time announcing that they intend to look to Russia for military assistance. The list of countries pushing for regime change in Syria is a bit longer. The United States, France, England, Germany, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Qatar, Turkey, and Israel. If seeing all these characters in bed together strikes you as strange, looking at their motives will clarify things considerably. There isn't just one motive for this bloodbath. Rather, there's a matrix of motives which intersect in some rather odd places. Of course, money had to play a role. In 2009, Qatar put forth a proposal to build a natural gas pipeline which would have passed through Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Syria, to Turkey, and into Europe. The president of Syria, however, rejected this proposal. Instead, in 2011, he forged a pact with Iraq and Iran to run a pipeline eastward, cutting Qatar and Saudi Arabia out of the loop completely. It was around this time that jihadists began flooding into the region intent on ousting Assad. The West presented these groups as freedom fighters. The vast majority of these militants, ISIS included, are Sunni jihadists, which is significant because Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, and Jordan are all Sunni as well. And Saudi Arabia in particular has a long history of spreading their preferred strain of Sunni extremism, Wahhabism, by investing heavily in building mosques, madrasas, schools, and Sunni cultural centers across the Muslim world. Now they have ISIS pushing it by the barrel of a gun. ISIS is not merely some dark aberration. Wahhabism as a philosophy calls for its adherents to take the reins of power by force and to impose Sharia law. Wahhabism also encourages its followers to persecute Shia Muslims, which they consider apostates. And of course apostasy is punishable by death. Iran is Shia. The current government in Iraq is Shia and has strong ties with Iran. A pipeline deal which Assad accepted would strengthen the Shia bloc and expand its regional influence. The Sunnis don't like this. In fact, they've even coined a term to describe it, the Shia Crescent. Let's be very clear. ISIS is not just a terrorist organization. It is a Sunni terrorist organization. That means it blocks and targets Shia. And that means it's serving the interests of Turkey and Saudi Arabia, even as it poses a threat to them. Because neither Turkey nor Saudi Arabia want an Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon bridge hmm. that isolates Turkey and cuts Saudi Arabia off. Israel also doesn't like the Shia Crescent at all. And they have decided to work with the Sunnis to form a parallel bloc to counterbalance Iran's influence. This is why Israel has launched numerous airstrikes against the Syrian government over the years and has provided medical care, logistical support, and safe passage to known jihadists. In 2013, Israel's ambassador to the U.S., Michael Oren, told the Jerusalem Post that, quote, The initial message about the Syrian issue was that we always wanted Bashar Assad to go. We always preferred the bad guys who weren't backed by Iran to the bad guys who were backed by Iran. This was the case, he said, even if the other bad guys were affiliated to al-Qaeda. Let that sink in for a moment. Now, at this point, if you were to ask any of these governments directly why they're arming and funding jihadists in Syria, they would claim that they are only supporting the moderate rebels, specifically the FSA. However, FSA commanders have gone on record to say that they cooperate with and conduct joint operations with al-Nusra, and ISIS and al-Nusra have officially formed alliances. And it is well established that the FSA command has been dominated by Islamic extremists for years. Furthermore, a think tank that was founded by Tony Blair released a report in 2015 which concluded that it was pointless to attempt to make the distinction between moderate rebels and jihadists, since the majority of these groups share ISIS's core belief system. It would impose Sharia law 
if they came into power. In this context, the support being given to these groups can only be interpreted as material support for terrorism, which is a crime. Now, the U.S. government has been arming, funding, and training these extremists, both covertly and overtly, since 2011. However, the support would have been impossible without the assistance of the regional members of the anti-Assad axis. For years, Jordan has allowed the CIA to run training camps for militant groups and has granted those militants safe passage into Syria. Qatar has also hosted these camps. In 2014, PBS visited one of these training camps and interviewed some of the trainees. One of the fighters told the reporters they were being trained, quote, how to finish off soldiers still alive after an ambush. Finishing off wounded soldiers is a clear violation of Geneva Conventions. It's a war crime. This is the hallmark of a terrorist organization, not moderate freedom fighters. Turkey has been the primary route for material and personnel headed in and out of jihadist territory for many years. A blatant example of this was the 400 tons of weapons that were looted from Gaddafi's armories, shipped to Turkey, then moved into Syria in 2012. At this stage, it was already clear that the majority of these weapons were ending up in the hands of jihadists. But nobody seemed to care. Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar have also assisted in the transfer of heavy weapons directly to al-Nusra by flying hundreds of cargo flights into Syria. And then there's the infamous Toyota trucks, which ISIS drives. U.S. counterterrorism officials made a show of investigating where they got these trucks, but it would have been much simpler if they had just called the U.S. State Department. According to the PRI, the U.S. State Department has been supplying Toyota Hiluxes, the exact model being used by ISIS, to the FSA for years. Knowing the real chain of alliances between these groups, it makes perfect sense that ISIS would end up behind the wheel. And let's not forget about the oil. At this stage, ISIS has reached a point where it no longer needs direct sponsorship. The organization earns an estimated $1 to $2 million a day through oil sales. The U.S. was aware of this, but did nothing to stop it. They didn't even condemn the country which was facilitating the sale of this oil. Russia, on the other hand, began targeting oil convoys headed into Turkey in November of 2015. Shortly thereafter, Turkey shut down a Russian Su-24 that supposedly violated Turkish airspace for 17 seconds. In response, Russia released satellite evidence that they claim shows how Turkey is smuggling oil from ISIS. The U.S. government dismissed this evidence, but didn't counter it with any evidence of their own. So where is the oil going? We're supposed to put that little detail out of our minds. All along, there have always been the, there's always been the idea that Turkey was supporting ISIS in some way. We know they've, um, they've funneled uh, uh, people going through Turkey to ISIS. Someone's buying that oil that ISIS is selling. It's going through somewhere. Uh, it looks to me like it's probably going through Turkey. They knew, but they did nothing. Why? Well, let's ask Mike Morrell, former deputy director of the CIA. Look, we don't want to destroy these oil tankers because that's infrastructure that's going to be necessary to support the people um, when ISIS isn't there anymore. Um, and it's going to create environmental damage. Right. And I suppose we didn't call out Turkey for buying the oil because we didn't want to hurt Erdogan's feelings. Clearly, it is not in the interest of the anti-Assad axis to eliminate ISIS. The United States and France are keen to make a show of airstrikes and special forces, but what they really want is the ability to operate in Syria militarily. This is the only way they'll have any chance of influencing the outcome. Trouble is, Russia is dug in. Unlike the United States and France, they have permission to operate in the country. and This has allowed them to set up bases and a strong anti-aircraft defense grid, which at any point could be used to enforce a no-fly zone. Washington is in a weak position. Can't really win from this angle. So they'll have to find a way to put Russia off balance and retake the momentum. It's important to remember the real stakes in this conflict. The West is in a state of decline. Their influence is waning. If the US and their allies fail to remove Assad from power, what they will be faced with is more than just a strong Shia crescent. If they fail, they risk being edged out of the entire region and replaced by Russia. This would give Russia an enormous amount of leverage in global energy markets. 
And this, of course, has serious implications for the petrodollar. For Washington, this is an unacceptable outcome. So expect the unexpected. This video is Creative Commons. You have permission to download and distribute any and all of our content through any venue, commercial or non-commercial. If you want more people to see this information, please remember to like, share, and comment. If you want to see how far the rabbit hole really goes, keep in touch. Subscribe to Storm Clouds Gathering on YouTube, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, and you can sign up for email notifications of new releases on our website, stormcloudsgathering.com. The list of countries pushing for regime change in Syria is a bit longer. United States, France, England, Germany, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Qatar, Turkey, and Israel. If seeing all these characters in bed together strikes you as strange, looking at their motives will clarify things considerably. There isn't just one motive for this bloodbath. Rather, there's a matrix below. First, let's outline the basic alliances. Russia, China, and Iran have all explicitly sided with the Syrian government. Russia is providing air support, advanced anti-aircraft missile systems, heavy weapons, and training. Iran, for its part, has troops on the ground. For the time being, China is more preoccupied with the ongoing tensions in the South China Sea and has not flexed its muscles in Syria as of yet. However, they should always be considered a wildcard variable. The current Iraqi government is also a wildcard. In 2015, they began to indicate where their loyalties lay in several meaningful ways. For example, they told the U.S. government that new ground operations were not welcome, while at the same time announcing that they intend to look to Russia for military assistance. The concept that humanity is teetering on the edge of a third world war is no longer the domain of the lunatic fringe. Those of you who have been paying attention know that in reality, the war is already underway. In this video, we're going to examine the profiles of the key players and the alliances they've formed, expose their motives, and present evidence of crimes that they've already committed. All of our sources will be available in the links of motives, which intersect in some rather odd places. Of course, money had to play a role. In 2009, Qatar put forth a proposal to build a natural gas pipeline, which would have passed through Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Syria, to Turkey, and into Europe. The president of Syria, however, rejected this proposal. Instead, in 2011, 